Chapter 7 The Trinity on Trial The God of modern Christianity has become nearly an impossibility to understand, but their doctrine of the Trinity is even worse. Trying to unravel the doctrine of the Godhead is a modern ecclesiastical maze. For over 1,600 years, this complicated mess has caused revolutions, banishments, prison, and even death. It is amazing how such a simple doctrine of the Bible could become one of the most complicated and confusing issues of Christianity. The Holy Trinity is a doctrine of the Godhead. For this reason, it is important to know and understand what it is. But that doctrine, in all of its variants, now borders on mysticism, paganism, and atheism, all bound together. The Baptists say that God is manifestly three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, but one in substance. That is like saying, I have one car in the garage, it's a Ford, a Chevrolet, and a Plymouth. The Eastern Orthodox Catholics, Episcopalians, and Lutherans also confirm this garbled expression of three persons but only one individual, or is it three individuals but only one person? The Methodists make about the same approach by saying that there are three distinct entities of one spirit substance which form a holy trinity. The Presbyterians say there are three personages, manifestations, but one in substance. The Roman Catholics have an interesting definition, if it can be defined, by saying there is one God capable of three personages, as three distinct, divine persons. The Unitarians, of course, have no belief in a trinity. They probably tried to understand the doctrine of trinity from the other churches and threw up their hands in disbelief. Can you blame them? How strange it is that the Christian churches of today have disagreed so much on simple doctrines, yet when it comes to defining the Godhead, they seem to agree on the most impossible and unbelievable doctrine ever concocted in the mind of man. Their doctrine of the Trinity requires us to comprehend something that is illogical, unreasonable, and utterly impossible. They even admit that it is so bewildering they must conclude by saying great is the mystery of God, that God, anyway. Although the Catholics and the Protestants have contended with each other over many centuries, they have come closer to agreement on the doctrine of the Godhead than most other doctrines. This is because it was a Catholic doctrine for many centuries, so when the Protestants protested against the authority of the Catholic priesthood, they didn't know any other definition on the Godhead. Thus, spiritual darkness, like a huge blanket, has covered them all together. But let us investigate further into their doctrine. Since they advocate a God that is everywhere, invisible, and without form or substance, it would be impossible for him to be either one or three. This ecclesiastical puzzle baffles both the simple and brilliant minds. It is a puzzle so absurd that it defies science, mathematics, and reason. To describe it would be to say that you were just informed that your wife had triplets. You rushed to the hospital and a nurse handed you one little baby and said, here are your triplets. Obviously you would question her sanity. The only thing more confusing than their declaration of this Trinity doctrine is their explanation of it. For instance, suppose Jesus taught his disciples, who were simple fishermen, tent makers, etc., the Godhead in this modern Christian terminology. The term Godhead or Godhood cannot be applied to the divine essence in distinction from the attributes, since the glory of God is precisely the totality of his attributes, and the attributes constitute his essence. God's being is a living unity, in the sense that each attribute is identical with his essence, the attributes are human distinctions, but they have their basis in the divine nature, and are affirmed in view of God's self-revelation. Zondervan's Pictorial Encyclopedia of the Bible 1, 766 With an explanation like that, his disciples would have gone back to fishing and making tents. How did such a conglomeration of philosophical nonsense ever get infused with the doctrines of Christianity? Why did a clear understanding of the Trinity as presented by Christ become so cloudy by 325 AD when the Nicene Creed was written? History provides the answer. Two principal factors resulted in the loss of divinely inspired leadership of the Church of Christ. First, the Church that Christ established had persecution problems from its origin. Every apostle of Christ was hunted down and killed. John Fox's research discovered that. 1. Stephen was stoned to death. 
2. James, the greater, was beheaded by a sword. 3. Philip was scourged, thrown into prison, and then crucified. 4. Matthew was slain with a sword. 5. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. 6. James, the lesser, at the age of 94 was beaten, stoned, and then his head busted open with a club. 7. Andrew was crucified. 8. Mark was dragged to death by the people of Alexandria. 9. Peter was crucified upside down on a cross. 10. Paul was beheaded in Rome. 11. Bartholomew was beaten and then crucified. 12. Jude was crucified at Edessa. 13. Thomas was thrust through with a spear. 14. Luke was hanged on an olive tree. 15. Simon was crucified in Britain. 16. John was cast into a cauldron of burning oil, and later, banished, to the Isle of Patmos. 17. Barnabas was supposedly killed in 73 AD. See Fox's Christian Martyrs, pages 26-35. Persecution seemed to be the heritage of Christ, and it followed his disciples as well. All of the inspired leaders were persecuted, imprisoned or killed, which left the weaker members to govern the church. As troubles mounted, these weak vessels would either compromise or abandon principles and doctrines to save their lives or their fortunes. Secondly, the semi-apostates within the church added problems. As bad as outside persecution was against the church, these traitors from within were worse. They would infuse the teachings and philosophies of pagans, spiritualists, or mystics as though they were part of Christianity. From the Apostle Judas to the sorcerer Simon, the teachings and doctrines of Christianity were nearly abolished. The Bible records a story of a sorcerer named Simon who was so devoid of the true spirit of the gospel that he tried to buy the power and authority of the apostles with money. See Acts 8 verses 9 and 13, 18-24. This man was once rebuked by Peter, but apparently he became penitent enough to enter the church. However, being a very influential and powerful man, it was not long until he began to introduce his heresies into the church. His followers also had a profound influence in the church, which continued down to the 4th century. The historian Eusebius wrote of this infection. These, after the manner of their founder, insinuating themselves into the church, like a pestilential and leprous disease, infected those with the greatest corruption, into whom they were able to infuse their secret, irremediable, and destructive poison. Ecclesiastical History, Book 2, Chapter 50 This Simon, known now as Simon Magus, is often referred to by other early Christian historians as the founder and perpetrator of some of the worst heresies ever to infect the Church. This blend of Christianity with the paid ministry became known as simony. John the Revelator was aware of many of these pernicious heresies and also mentioned the Nicolaitanes and the followers of the doctrines of Balaam. See Revelation 2 verse 15. Added to these perils against Christianity were the Judaistic converts who tried to harmonize their new faith with some of their old and false traditions. Jesus warned them of putting new wine into old bottles and new cloth to old garments, see Matt 9 16, 17, but they did it anyway. Another problem for Christianity was the Gnostic philosophers who boasted of being able to lead the mind into a full comprehension of the mysteries of deity. But men were told they had to become celibate in order to qualify for this great comprehension. There was opposition to these philosophers, and they became known as the agnostics, a term still used for those doubting the existence of God. Another sect of philosophers entering the Christian domain were the Platonists, or followers of Plato. One of their dictums was the position and authority of the Word. They leaned towards the Word mentioned in John's writings when he said, In the beginning, was the Word, and the Word was God. Asterisk, 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 and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 verses 1 and 14, according to these Platonists, the Word was the same as Logos, described by Plato. From there, they continued to insert other Platonic thought. The assimilation of heathen and pagan works became incorporated into the thought and doctrine of the Christians. Because the infusion was slow and gradual, it was not noticed by most of the members of the church. By the end of the third century, however, Christianity had become a hybrid offspring, 
blossoming from the unnatural union of pagan philosophy and the doctrines of Christ. Even the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had been retired and replaced with the God of the pagans. However, this did not end the contention and controversies within the church. A Nice Mass from Nice In the beginning of the year 300 AD, disputations arose over the doctrine of the Godhead between Alexander, the Bishop of Alexandria, and Arius, another officer of the church. Arius reaffirmed the doctrine that the Son had been created by the Father, and was an agent through whom the will of the Father was accomplished. He reasoned that the Son was inferior to the Father, both in nature and dignity, and that the Holy Ghost was inferior to the other two members of the Godhead. Although a great portion of the Church had believed this kind of trinity, it was denounced with vigor by others, such as Alexander, who believed in the absolute divinity of Jesus and that he was co-equal to the Father from all eternity. This rivalry became so hostile that it was not only tearing the Church apart, but it was causing trouble within the Roman Empire. Because of this outbreak, the Roman Emperor Constantine was forced to intervene, trying to re-establish peace and order in his domain. His first effort was to summon a council of church authorities in the year 325 AD. He invited about 1,800 dignitaries, but only slightly over 300 showed up. This gathering became known as the Council of Nice, because it was assembled in the city of Nice in Bithynia, northwest Asia Minor. After many heated discussions and disputes, the council worked toward a creed that could be adopted as the official declaration for the church. A creed was not easy to produce. There was no apostle or prophet head of the church to declare the revealed word of God. Instead, there were three main factions represented, one, Athanasians, Athanasius was the spokesman for Bishop Alexander, who were mostly Orthodox Egyptians and Occidentals. 2. Arian moderates, the most popular segment. Consisting, generally of Orientals supporting the divinity of Christ, whose main spokesman was Eusebius, and, 3. Arius more radical defenders, about 20 in number. By the time all of the philosophies, interpretations of scriptures, and traditional beliefs were considered, there was very little harmony on anything that could be put down on paper. This council quarreled over the nature of God, the nature of his Son, and mostly the relationship of the Son to the Father. To believe that the Son was separate from the Father would of necessity admit a belief in two divine beings, or two gods, and they didn't want to accept that. Arius was not given a seat in this council, but he was allowed to speak. He defended his position that the scriptures clearly identified the Father and Son as distinct personages, and that the Son was subordinate to the Father. The majority of the council could not adopt that doctrine because they came from different schools of philosophy. Eusebius, the noted historian from Nicomedia, was of the moderate Arian party. He stated that there was one God, Father, all sovereign, Creator. Point one Lord Jesus Christ, the firstborn of all created begotten of God the Father, and in one Holy Ghost. He based his belief on Scripture rather than philosophies. The scripture stated, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John 5 verse 7, this contradicted the Greek and Jewish advocates. The longer they contended, the further into mysticism they waited. Finally, they bogged down in the mire of incomprehensible mysteries. Some advocates said the Father, as a substance, could be neither divided nor diminished. With that profound thought, they reasoned the Son must also be of the same substance. The Son must be of one substance or essence with the Father, therefore, the Word is not created, He is begotten and therefore produced in a perfect image of one's own self. The Son is then the essence or substance of the Father. This didn't make much sense to some of them, but it slowed down the arguments. Athanasius became elated when they began to agree that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were only different names for different manifestations of one supreme being, and that the one substance was indivisible. Now the council began to draw some definite conclusions. It was affirmed that three distinct persons in the deity were one, immaterial, God. Athanasius announced this as a great new plateau of knowledge and that these were incomprehensible mysteries. No one could argue with that. 
The Emperor Constantine, who sat in these sessions, agreed that he was hearing great and marvelous things. However, it must be remembered that this man, who was not yet a baptized Christian, not until twelve years after this council met, was to sit in judgment on the kind of godhead the Christians were to believe. Constantine asked the council to draw up a creed that all persons in his empire could adopt. They presented the following document, notoriously known as the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son, Word, of, God, begotten of the Father, only begotten, that is of the essence, substance, of the Father. God from God, light from light, life from life, very God from very God, begotten not made, of one essence, substance, with the Father, through whom all things came to be, both things in heaven and things on earth. Who for the sake of us men and for our salvation, came down and was made flesh, and became man, suffered, and rose on the third day, ascended into the heavens, to the Father, is coming to judge living and dead, and in one Holy Spirit. Apostasy from the Divine Church, James L. Barker, page 263. There were some problems with contradictions so efforts were made to clarify them, resulting in incomprehensible mysteries. Son, he is distinct numerically from the Father, but Son, he is of the same substance as the Father, and he is the same substance absolutely as the Father, because this substance, which is communicated to him, being God, could be neither divided nor diminished. It is with a serene intrepidity that Athanasius announces these incomprehensible mysteries, of which his intelligence does not seek to pierce the shadows, but which he perceives as the inescapable consequence of certain data of revelation. Ibid, page 264. The Council believed this explanation, even if they couldn't understand it. God was distinct numerically from the Son, yet they were one substance that could not be divided. That truly was a beautiful incomprehensible mystery adopted by the Council. This conclusion was certainly far removed from the New Testament doctrine as taught by the Savior and his apostles, and is definitely not Scripture. Athanasius was pleased with the outcome, and it sounded so good to the emperor, that he made a decree, everyone in that council would be forced to sign the creed. If they didn't, they would be banished. Yet, there were some who thought it still contained some errors and would not concede. Arius was exiled to Illyria. Bishop Secundus and Bishop Theognus and several other priests were also banished. All the writings of Arius and of his friends were burned. So bitter was the resentment against this man that everyone was threatened with death if they concealed any of his writings. Eusebius made a slight change in the wording of the document that he was to sign. Someone detected it and so he, too, with Theognis, was given a one-way ticket out of town. However, three to four years later, Constantine pardoned Arius, Eusebius and Theognis. Eusebius returned from exile and had great influence with the emperor until Constantine's death in 337 AD. Thus, the Nicene Creed was for a time the accepted philosophy of all Christian churches, Orthodox Catholic, Roman Catholic, and Protestant. It was hailed as one of the greatest doctrinal announcements since the days of Christ, but, in reality, it was an inconsistent absurdity, unfounded in reason or scripture. It was a tragedy. The only truth connected with this creed was the fact that it was called an incomprehensible mystery. In summary, then, it was initiated, approved, and enforced by a pagan-believing emperor, not by prophets, apostles, or because of a revelation from God. It was an edict of the learned philosophers, with new terms, expressions, and a speculative theological theory. The philosophical thought of the Athenian Greeks held more credence in the meeting than the early Christian doctrines. Constantine's council was literally an affair of state, more than an affair of the church. It was historically a product of political policy rather than a religious manifestation. This strange mixture of men and backgrounds concluded that the Trinity represented three persons, all of one substance. Three is one and one for all was better adapted as the slogan for the three musketeers than the Trinity doctrine of the Nicene Christians. The final conclusion of the Nicene Council was best expressed by some Catholic authorities who said, a God understood is a God dethroned. Talk about mysticism, paganism and superstition. 
They want a God who is incomprehensible, invisible, immaterial and who is everywhere, in everything and not understood. What a God! It certainly outmystified any heathen God. Not long after the adoption of the Nicene Creed, an anti-Nicene reaction developed and mushroomed under the leadership of Eusebius. The strongest supporters of the original creed were deposed, including Athanasius who had succeeded Alexander as Bishop of Alexandria. Constantine exiled him to Treves. Constantine ordered that Arius be reinstated in the church, but the day before this was to occur, the body of Arius burst asunder like Judas, ending his life and his mysterious writings. After Constantine's death, his three sons became emperors of various sections of the empire and in the spirit of reconciliation, they recalled Athanasius and his bishops from exile. Rome in the west was predominantly Athanasian, Antioch in the east was largely Arian, and Alexandria at the mouth of the Nile had strong supporters of both factions. During the next several years a compromise creed was in the making between the Athanasians and Arians. Many ecumenical councils were called and controlled by the emperor, but no satisfactory results were achieved. About 360 the question arose of the Holy Ghost as the third person of the Trinity. Up until that time, the confusion was mostly over the Father and the Son. Somewhere between 420 and 430 AD the Athanasian Creed was written, which was so called because in many manuscripts it was entitled The Faith of Saint Athanasius. Of the three ancient creeds of Christendom, Apostles, Nicene, and Athanasian, this one is the most rigid, as can be seen by reading the following. We worship one God in Trinity, and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons, nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, is all one, the glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Such as the Father is, such as the Son, and such as the Holy Ghost. The Father uncreate, the Son uncreate and the Holy Ghost uncreate. The Father incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. The Father eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Ghost eternal. And yet there are not three eternals, but one eternal. As also there are not three incomprehensibles, nor three uncreated, but one uncreated, and one incomprehensible. So likewise the Father is Almighty the Son Almighty, and the Holy Ghost Almighty, and yet there are not three Almighties, but one Almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. The Creeds of Christendom, Philip Schaff, Volume 2, pages 66-67. One thing for certain, they have adopted not three incomprehensibles for their Trinity, but one incomprehensible God, or is it three? three separate personages in the Trinity. The scriptures have actually made the doctrine of the Trinity easy to understand. It is the philosophical interpretations of men and their pagan ideologies that have taken this doctrine into the realm of the unknown and incomprehensible. The Apostle John explains three separate personages in heaven. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. 1 John 5 verse 7 is there any difficulty in understanding the number of personages that are in heaven bearing witness? But this is certainly not the only scripture that substantiates the concept of a plural Godhead. We are told that Jesus was born a babe in Bethlehem and that he grew in stature, spirit, and wisdom just as all of God's children do. The scriptures further state that for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. John 5 verses 26-27, in short. 1. The Father gave life to the Son. 2. The Father gave authority to the Son. 3. They had a literal father-slash-son relationship. Then at the beginning of Christ's ministry. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matt, 3, 16-17
It is evident that there were three personages in three different places at the same time, 1. Jesus was in the river Jordan, 2. The Father spoke from heaven, and, 3. The Holy Ghost descended like a dove. The scriptures also inform us that the Father taught and instructed the Son, for the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth, John 5 verse 20. This implies that God the Father assumed the role of a real Father, to a real Son. He taught him the things he understood. If the Trinity were all one entity, or essence, how could it be instructing itself? Jesus once stated that, My Father is greater than I, John 14 verse 28. This, too, is evidence that one is separate from the other, because of a greater and lesser relationship. If one thing is greater than another, they both are different, as a quart of milk is greater than a pint, even though they are both milk. There must be two entities. If an apostle is greater than a deacon, there must be two people. It matters not whether it refers to size, official calling, or intelligence. The Father knew things that the Son did not, as shown when Jesus said, But of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Mark 13 verse 32, Jesus also once admitted that the Son can do nothing of himself, John 5 verse 19. Another time Jesus said, Why chiaest thou me good? There is none good, but one, that is God. Mark 10 verse 18, While in mortality, there was a difference between Jesus and the Father in their goodness. Jesus said, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent, John 17 verse 3. Jesus was sent by the Father to complete a mission on earth. If a man sends his son to the store, there are two people involved, one remaining while the other leaves, the Son is under the direction of the Father. When Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed to the Father, not to himself, and said, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matt 26, 39, Jesus had his own will, he wanted to live, but first he wanted to do the will of the Father. The Father didn't want him to avoid the crucifixion, so Jesus then changed to the Father's will. Two personages, two minds, and two wills are demonstrated here. That should not be difficult to understand. While on the cross, Jesus experienced some difficulties which were beyond his understanding. Something occurred which he had not expected, and he prayed, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matt 27, 46, the personage on the cross was pleading with someone in heaven. Jesus did not understand something and was asking the Father to enlighten his understanding. And after the resurrection of Christ, he appeared to Mary. Being overcome in her grief, she ran to embrace him, but he said to her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, John 20 verse 17. Jesus was in a physically different place than the Father, because he was going to ascend to where the Father was. He was not going to ascend to himself. Jesus was in one place, the Father was in another. Unity of the Trinity The initial controversy over such phrases as he that hath seen me hath seen the Father, John 14 verse 9, has been a stumbling block to scriptorians. Jesus made this reply to the disciples who wanted to see what God the Father looked like. It was obvious that Jesus was saying that God looked like him. After all, Jesus was his son, and a son usually resembles his father. This was also to teach them that the father had a body, an image, and physical appearance similar to that which Jesus had. From another verse Jesus said, The father is in me, and I in him, John 10 verse 38. This refers to the moral principles they believed and taught, there was a close union of their spirit, will, and intent. Then to add to the confusion, Jesus made the statement that I and my Father are one, John 10 verse 30. Jesus was referring to their union in doctrine, principles, commandments, and the laws. They were united in their purposes and their will. They were animated and made powerful by the same Holy Spirit. This statement is further clarified by Christ when he prayed for his disciples, asking that they all may be one, as thou Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us that they may be one, even as we are one, John 17 verses 21-22. This is almost too obvious for anyone not to understand. 
Jesus wanted all of his disciples to be in perfect unity and harmony, just as he and his Father were. He wanted them to believe, to understand, and to desire the same things. He certainly was not talking about a physical oneness, that they should all be rolled up into one big ball substance, or all occupy the same body. Because of the misunderstanding of these quotations, the Greek and Roman philosophers came up with the essence doctrine because they simply couldn't understand what these scriptures meant. The answer was simple for men such as John who wrote them, but after a few centuries, they became difficult to interpret by the Greeks and Romans. Cicero wisely said, There is never a proper ending to reasoning which proceeds on a false foundation. Many of our present-day Christian doctrines were founded on the dictates of the Emperor Constantine and his interpretation and definition of God. From that shaky foundation, there can never be anything but strange and erroneous scriptural interpretations. Christ was a part of the Godhead, yet he had a body of flesh and bones, while in mortality. He often prayed to his Father, who was in heaven. The distinction is so obvious that there should be no error in understanding these scriptures. Consider these additional scriptures that further clarify this mystery of their unity and yet separate entities. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16 For the Father loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that himself doeth. John 5 verse 19 Forasmuch then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven, by art and man's device. Acts 17 verse 29 Which he wrought in Christ, when he raised him from the dead, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Ephesians 1 verse 20 There is one God, and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man. Luke 2 verse 52. And further, when the Father spoke of Jesus, he said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Matt, 317, Mark 1 verse 11, Luke 3 verses 22, and 2 Peter 1 17. If we were to believe in the concept that the Father and the Son were the same person, we would necessarily have to, believe that the Father was saying, I am surely pleased with myself. If the following questions can be answered affirmatively, then one has a reasonable understanding of who God and Christ are and how men can become like deity. 1. Is Jesus Christ a perfect manifestation of God the Father? 2. Is Christ in the reality of God's personage? 3. Did Jesus possess a body with a form, an image, and likeness to man? 4. Did Christ have a body of flesh and bone? 5. Did Christ have body parts and passions? 6. Did Christ once dwell in the heavens, and then come down to earth in mortality? 7. Did not Jesus become increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and man? Luke 2 verse 52. 8. Did Christ not change from heavenly to earthly, from a child to a man, from mortality to immortality, and become a resurrected personage? 9. Did he not pray to his Father in heaven, indicating that he and the Father were separate beings? The whole world is in confusion about who God is, and they have conjured up every conceivable type of a God to worship. Only the prophets are acquainted with the true God of heaven. God is a friend to them, he speaks to them, and he reveals many important things which are hidden from the rest of the world. He explains many things about himself and about some of the mysteries of heaven. Consider how clear and understandable these things are to the prophet, Brigham Young. When you are prepared to see our Father, you will see a being with whom you have long been acquainted, and he will receive you into his arms, and you will be ready to fall into his embrace and kiss him, as you would your fathers and friends that have been dead for a score of years, you will be so glad and joyful. Would you not rejoice? When you are qualified and purified, so that you can endure the glory of eternity, so that you can see your Father, and your friends who have gone behind the veil, you will fall upon their necks and kiss them, as we do an earthly friend that has been long absent from us, and that we have been anxiously desiring to see. This is the people that are and will be permitted to enjoy the society of those happy and exalted beings. JD 4,54-55 It is sad that so many preachers of religion know so little about God. 
They conclude their opinions about him with statements like, Great is the mystery of God. Yet when living prophets try to teach them the truth, they persecute and even kill them, just as they did anciently. But, the honest in heart shall learn about God, how to pray to him, and how to prepare to meet him again.